Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another exciting edition of Mentorship Learning Series. Please mute yourself, please, if you are not speaking. All right. Today, we have a very special personality in person of Mr. Victor Adebayo, who we're also privileged to have as one of our members here at HR Mentorship, and of course, it belongs to multiple numerous um, platforms, both online and physical. Today will be teaching us or speaking to us or engaging with us, discussing with us on HR, moving beyond administration in 2023. We're already planning ahead. It is never too early to plan ahead. Victor Adebayo was until recently the chief operating officer <coughs> Excuse me, at CIG Group, where he oversaw strategy, business intelligence, human resources, corporate services, and distribution operations. Prior to taking on that mantle of leadership at CIG, he served as the director overseeing the human resources, administration, security, and safety, health, and environmental functions at Airtel Network. He is an alumnus of organizations such as Summit, Tranrai Group, First Bank Nigeria, Quest Merchant Bank, General Electric Oil and Gas, Procter and Gamble, Zenith Bank, and DTL Systems and Education Consulting. He had had experiences in HR, business development, office management, finance, operations, and educational consulting. At the moment, as at the time we updated his profile last, he was on the board, or he's on the board of three institutions, Diversity Talent Management Limited, an HR and strategy consulting firm, APN Way School, the full-fledged nursery, primary, and secondary school, Mega Life Limited, Health Limited, a medical diagnostics, laboratory services, pharmacy, and wellness center. He was also in the past a director on the board of Seamless HR and HR Technology Fair and Fly Networks and Education Consulting Fair. He has attended executive learning sessions at Harvard Law School, participating in the leadership and negotiation program, and he has also attended the London School of Economics and Political Science, graduating with an A plus distinction at the strategic decision-making program. He obtained his bachelor's and master's degree from Obafemiola University. Just to say, I met him and became his friend at the, at Obafemiola University where we both did the MBA together. But he did remember to take me to Harvard and London School of Economics. We'll talk about that often. He holds two global HR certification. GPHR, that is Global Practitioner Human Resources, and SHRM, okay, Senior Certified Professional. And one Nigerian HR certification is a member, not a member, of the Chara Institute. He is a certified management consultant and fellow Institute of Management Consultants. He is a conference speaker and an active training, leadership, and strategy sessions. His areas of facilitation include, but not limited to, strategy, human resources, customer service, and business development, leadership, and general soft skills. Victor is happily married with three lovely angels, and he pastors his local assemblies group of youth churches. You will see that even from his profile, you are the ministry of Victor Adibayo. Thank you for honoring us. You are welcome, my brother. You have the floor. Thank you very, very much. Thank you very much. And then good evening, everybody. Um, I didn't think you were going to go through that whole manuscript, but anyway, <laughs> thanks a lot. I, I think it's a great pleasure for me to be here and to be able to share with everyone in this um, knowledge sharing session. Um, it's a great honor that I do not take for granted. 
Um, I know I do have this tendency sometimes, uh, and it's simply because of the way I am wired. Um, I count every moment spent, you know, as very important. I don't joke with my time because time is a resource you never can get back. And so anytime I get the opportunity of addressing or speaking with people, you know, I get into overthink mode. And why? Because I know the way I cherish my time. I assume every other person cherishes their own time that way. And so I kept asking myself the question, how do we make this session worthwhile for people? How do I ensure that it's a very, very rich session and a session that is quite expository for everyone? You know, I was recently speaking with one of my mentees, and then I was talking about trends in human resources. And please, pardon me, and I would say, do well to permit me to speak unrestrained and not to color code the situation, because I will want to be as brutally honest as possible, you know, speaking with every one of us today. And this lady, she's the head of HR for an organization, and we got talking, and she told me about some recruitment. I also told her about some recruitment that I'm doing in my new firm, and she said, what's the issue, boss? And I'm like, look, it's tough getting qualified HR professionals nowadays. And she was like, boss, tell me what you mean. I said, look, we have too many HR coordinators. She was like, boss, I thought I was alone on this table. And then she went on and on into how many people she had interviewed. I said, you know, when I'm talking to people about human resources and I tell them, tell me about your HR experience and they go, oh, you know, I'm the one in charge of the um, attendance. I take all the attendance, which we use for input for payroll. I am the one in charge of all of our training. Then I say, oh, interesting. So tell me about training. Oh, so anytime we have training, I'm the one who will send the email to all the people inviting them for the training. And then I get the hall ready. ready. I ensure that all the things we need, all the feedback form. And I'm like, okay. So after that, um, and then I go into asking specific questions like, you know, how do you determine your training plan? How do you know the training requirement of the organization? What are your reference tools for training requirement? And then I go into questions around recruitment and I talk to them about, so how do you start the whole manpower planning process? And then how do you then decide on whether you want to recruit internally or you want to go externally and then if you want to go internally what are your reference points what are your reference materials if you want to do recruitment externally what is the step-by-step -step process involved in all of these things and believe you me people are lost i'm like really is this all people do We've got people who coordinate HR activities. And that is very, very separate from the practice and the act of human resources. Now, I understand there are so many routes into human resources and very many of us think, oh, let me write my CIPM. I do advocate that you should write your CIPM, by the way. Oh, once I write my CIPM and that's it. No, that's not it. CIPM gives you the overview of what human resources is. First to your knowledge and your assimilation of HR processes and systems, but there is a science to human resources. There is a craft involved in human resources and there is an act evolved, involved rather, in human resources. So it's important you understand all of these things. And, and I will share some insights. And I mean, I, I do tons and tons of interviews and you know, I'm getting bored during interviews now because I struggle to be able to get you know, what I'm looking out for. And that's why when we start talking about the topic to handle, I said, look, we need to get our HR professionals right. And especially if we call our group HR mentors, Let's properly mentor people, you know, about what 
human resources is truly about. And that's why I gave it this title, HR, Moving Beyond Administration. You can otherwise call it HR MBA in 2023. So ladies and gentlemen, I hope my introductory speech was not boring and I hope it wasn't daring and I hope it wasn't con condescending. It was just a charge and a clarion call for us to be able to make distinct the profession of human resources. Trust me, I have just about 15 slides, one video for us to watch. And there is a group exercise. Yeah, yeah, trust me. You know, I'm going to retire a school principal. So trust me, you guys are going to do examination in this. Uh-huh. So then I will tell all of you to come on video. No hiding your face. So if you have already put your night uh, mascara on, go and wash your face now. <laughs> because we will see that face with the mascara if you are not careful. <laughs> so welcome on board, everyone. And let's go zoom in right into this. What is moving beyond administration? Let's go back to the history and the evolution of human resources practice. Because of the manufacturing environment, you know, the industrial age, and some of the accidents that happened during the industrial age, that was what led to the formation of the earliest form of human resources, which is now known in the body of HR as industrial relations. And all they were doing was simply a go-to center for collective bargaining. So employees have a grievance, employees have a challenge. Oh, something is happening. No, we cannot just work like this. We need protection in the factory. We need all of that because it was more of the machine age. The age when equipments and tools were more important than human life. Nowadays, we call it the knowledge economy, which means it's a function of what you know and not so much as to, you know, bolts and knots and the rest of those things. Then we moved on to personnel management. And what do we do in personnel management? It's all about filing, administration, keeping records and documents, event coordination, which is the bulk of what many of us do. And then management process execution. So management just calls us, HR, go and tell them this, 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 this. Yes, sir. And then you just go ahead and carry it out. Anything that they want to do, you just, you know, get it done. You just find a way to ensure that this happens. Personnel management. Then we came to human resources, whereby we then started the introduction of specialist roles, talent management, performance management, talent acquisition, learning and development specialists employee relations, industrial relations, you know, and the rest of the specialization within human resources. And then we moved on further to what? Developing policies. And then of course, administration was still something we carried along with us into human resources management. And there's nothing we can do about that. There's always gonna be that administration part of it. But my dear brothers and sisters in the Lord, They've told you I'm a pastor, so there's nothing you can do about it. <laughs> you need to understand this one bit. Don't stay comfortable in HR administration. And that's why we are saying moving beyond administration. Don't just stay comfortable running around, passing papers around, and then conducting all of those interviews where we ask them questions. In the next five years, where do you see yourself? In Canada, Jackpa. Who that one help? What does that question get to know? But those are some of the interviews that many of you guys ask. Those are some of the questions. And then we don't ask competency-based interviews. Anyway, I'm gonna put that you know, on one side. We're not gonna branch into all of that, but you've got to be strategic. And that's when we then moved on to strategic human resources. And what does this entail? It simply means preempting management's needs and then refining processes to meet those needs in the light of current reality. 
See, don't wait to be told what to do. It's one of those major things we see, even in the art and in the process of management. You are not just being told what to do, but you are consciously setting your own goals. I take a look at the organization and I'm asking the question, what do we need from a people point of view? So, Hey, somebody's child has joined us. Future HR manager, thank you very much for calling mommy's attention to your needs. <laughs> and then finally, we moved on to what is known as contemporary human resources contemporary human resources. And what does this entail? We're talking about predictive business support, leveraging on bespoke competencies. What is your own background? Your background is not just administrative. Oh, I'm general everything, general everything. Employees come to meet me for their needs and then I present it to management. And then, you know, I follow up with management to be able to do everything that they need and all of that. And see, you are a coordinator, not an HR professional. Just say management coordinator, MC in the organization. That is not human resources. And then we will begin to look into all of these things one after the other. So. Leveraging on your bespoke competencies, capacity, data, data analysis, and vision of the future business climate. Now, let me tell you something about data, you know, and this is not something you're gonna, you are going to learn in any of your MBA schools or any of the HR schools. So I sat in the middle of our office at some point in time. Uh, this was during my Procter & Gamble days. And as I sat there, I looked around. It was an open floor sit setting. So I looked around the entire office and I'm like, whoa, we got a problem here. And my boss, you know, looked at me and said, Victor, what's the problem? I said, I have just looked at our short report. Short report is our earliest form of, you know, data gathering. And the short report showed that we have about 45% of our employee population being ladies. And of course, this woman being a feminist that she was, and she was like, and how is that a problem? And then the next thing I said is, well, you know, of this population, 80% of that 45%, if you get my mathematics, I know some of you went into HR to be able to avoid mathematics. Let me just bust your bubble. You ain't gonna escape mathematics. So all your psychology in the university or your sociology, so that you will never see maths again. Hello, maths, if they look you for eye, you will face maths again in HR. So don't let me scare you, but yes, you will face maths again in human resources. Now, I said about 80% of that 45%. So to help those of us struggling with the mathematics. So let's assume we have an organization of 100 people. So 45% means that what? 45 people. Now I am saying 80% of those 45 people, which is about 37 people or 35 people, are ladies between the age group of 22 and 27. And she was like, Victor, can you please speak English? And I'm like, look, from the cultural nuances of our nation in Nigeria, Oh, Bob Balajoko has let the cat out of the bag. <laughs> they are at the childbearing age. Uh -uh. I'm talking about a Procter and Gamble multinational FMCG, the biggest of them back in the day, the highest paying. You don't finish university. You get work for a multinational company. Then they send you go Istanbul, go, you know, Geneva and all of those places. When you come home, they give you brand new Tata or Tara Moto. You drive and go greet your mama for house. As you are giving the, ah, mommy, I brought you this. Daddy, I brought you that. The next thing they'll be asking you is, ah, how are you? After like 10 minutes that they've given you water to drink, my dear sisters in the Lord, what will your parents be discussing with you again? How far now? Uh, when are we going to meet him? 
You know, the default answer I tell some people is, mommy, when I was going to school, you told me not to look into the eyes of any man. I am not looking into the eyes of anybody. They say, now look. If I look more than their eyes. <laughs> look into them now. <laughs> Those times we say you should close your eyes. Yes, close your eyes. But now, open your eyes. If I wear God will join. <laughs> when are you bringing this man home? And guess what? In the African environment, I know many of us nowadays, you know, like we say too, I, I did it too when I got married. And I mean, I had to fight my mom off to say, look, leave me alone. Let me enjoy marriage first before childbearing responsibilities come. We have agreed that the first one year, no child. So we just want to enjoy ourselves and all of that. My dear, on your wedding day, that is when they're already telling you, Nine months from today, we are gathering together again. Whether you are ovulating or not, they don't care. They just believe that nine months from that day, they are coming back again to come and start, you know, hallelujah, somebody. And every other thing happens. Now, I had gone looking into some templates. And what did I do? Number one, there was a report by NECA. National Employers Consultative Association, where they had opined back then, I'm talking about 2004, 2005, 2006, they had opined then that what? Most women want to take a career break after their first or second child in Nigeria. We did not have a support structure for working moms like we do have today, back in the day. So there was the tough reality of combining being an employee or a professional, a wife, and a mother. At the same time, it was really, really tough within the organization. So most of them want to take a career break so they can raise their families. And after a while, they want to come back and then continue their careers. It is not a crime, even in our contemporary times, there are still women who do that, God bless them, you know, for prioritizing. And those who choose not to do so, God bless them also, do whatever works for you and whatever works between you and your spouse, and don't let anybody dictate anything to you. But you and your spouse needs to be in agreement of what you guys wanna do. But then there was a reality for me, with 45% of my workforce being women, and about 80% of these people being women that fall into this category, also understanding the cultural nuances and the revelation from the NECA report. Should I be worried, ladies and gentlemen? Yes, I should be. So if I took a random figure of saying 30% of this female population get married the following year. That is telling me that what? In two to three years time, I'm going to be losing about 20% of my total female workforce who would be in charge of strategic roles within the organization. As human resources, how do I begin to prepare in advance of this thing? It is not your CEO that will tell you that. It is not going to be taught to you in any MBA school. It is basically contemporary human resources, leveraging the power of data, actively seeking information that is relevant to your organization, and then looking into the future of your business. And then the fact that what? The business climate is changing every day, every time. All of that helps you to know that what you then have to start ringing bells. Your predictive capabilities must immediately come up. And then you begin to think, what do we do? Should the answer now be stop hiring women, run away from women, hell, stop the women. We had that problem in Airtel. In fact, in Airtel, it was just 26% of our employee population that were ladies. And some of the line managers, because Airtel operates a very lean structure, and some of the line managers were beginning to, you know, murmur and grumble that, you know, that one too is going on maternity leave, that one is this, that one is that. Look, HR, we want a, you know, a work-friendly environment, but guess what? I'm killing my people here because when they are gone, they are gone for three months, and some of them will come and say they want to do extended maternity leave in six months. I can't hire, I can't do this, blah, 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 blah. So what did we do? So somebody is waiting, oh yeah, tell us, what did you do? Should I tell you? So I stratified it. Can we hire women in different age groups, in different family life cycle? There are those who are still young, free. We call them the triple S, single, settled and satisfied. 
They are not thinking of, you know, all the cultural requirements. There are those who are in the childbearing age. There are those who have passed that childbearing age. And there are those who are the more matured, older generation of people. Can we then ensure that our diversity is not just gender focused, but also looks at the gender in their demographics? Further splitting it down the line. So I don't have all my female population within the ages of 22 and 24. Because when the issues arise, I'm gonna be dealing with a significant proportion of my workforce having to deal with that issue. So spread it across because we must also bring what this diversity brings to the table of our organization. And remember the old essence of diversity is not just for us to be able to mark the numbers of we have male or we have female. It is actually for us to be able to harvest the benefit of the uniqueness that each person brings to the table because we are serving a very diverse group of people and they are representatives of the diversity of the customer base of our organization. I hope you are getting me and I hope I'm not too slow or too fast for you. I hope you are seeing all of this. Now, nobody is going to sit you down to tell you some of these things. These are some of the things that moving beyond administration in human resources does for you. So data is important. Then the vision of the future business climate. I'm going to talk about all of those as I go into what does moving beyond administration all entails. Now, once a strategic decision has been established within your organization, what are some of those levels within HR or operates within the organization? There's this transformational HR, which is part of what we're talking about right now. About five to 15% of your work responsibility must be within that scope. And what are you looking at? Strategic redirection. We'll talk about how to do all of this and renewal cultural change, because this is the first time in several generations that we are having multi-generations represented within the workplace. And these multi-generations have their different needs. And I can give you the easiest of them. You know, the older generation wants investments that are capital preserving, while the younger generation want their money now, because they will tell you, do I know whether I will make it to 60? I bet may I chop my money now. Don't do any long-term incentive for me. I want, give me my money now. Let me spend it. Now my life, make I chop up. That is what many of them are actually looking forward to. Then management development, because we are even having younger people represented within the organization now. It now becomes very, very important for us to be able to manage the leadership capabilities of these people, because many of them were promoted into senior levels on the basis of their technical acumen, and nobody is looking at their people capacity management skills. At the end of the day, you have an HR issue that you will need to deal with. So transformational. Then you look at the traditional thing, which is the specialization, like I made mention of earlier on. Recruitment, selection, training, employee relations, performance management and compensation and benefits and the rest of them. That's about 15 to 30% of your job. Then transactional HR, which is the administration part. That is where most people are satisfied. Just give me a template, la cram, la pour, la pass, la execute every day. Why they are using that template, how they could even better that template, they aren't thinking about it. They aren't thinking about it at all. All they are just looking at is you know, you've given them a template to work with and they're happy working with that template. Six years, seven years, eight years, nine years, 10 years down the line, still doing that same thing. Now, beyond all of these things, there is process redesign that human resources must get involved in. There is what? The impact of information technology on everything that we do, our human resources information system. And that is you now putting your data into action. 
And then there's outsourcing. I have to specifically put this uh, word in parentheses because when I mention outsourcing, what comes to the mind of everybody is probably contract staff or probably, you know, um, all those manpower outsourcing thing. There is also what we call business process outsourcing, where an entire department does not exist within an organization, but it is outsourced to another organization who completely runs the end to end of that process. Do you know there are organizations that do not have their own internal HR department? Yes, in the firm Diversity Talent, we have clients like that, who they don't have their own HR department, the HR department is dependent on our team to manage. We were doing business with a client who was based in Abuja some time ago. That client does not have a finance department. They are in the IT space. They don't have a finance department. Their finance department is entirely run by one of the audit firms in Nigeria. So those people resume every day in their office. They process all of their financial transactions, everything end-to-end -end financial transaction within that organization. And not one of them is a staff of that company. Business process outsourcing. And HR guys need to be very, very aware of all of these things. Now, how do we get into the moving beyond administration context for HR? I'm gonna be talking about all of these eight points quickly. And then I'm going to open up for question and answer, and we can do a bit more consulting for everyone. So the first thing is understand the internal and external business context. Two, create strategic alignment. Three, initiate and lead change. Four, build employee commitment and capability. Five, execute with excellence. Six, champion and protect the ethics and due process within your organization. That's a very interesting one. And I'm gonna be sharing a lot of stuff with you within that space. And then the last two, which I lumped together, HR technical mastery, whether it's employee relation, whether it's talent development, whatever it may be, please have a background. Don't just say I'm an HR generalist. Can you manage recruitment end to end? Understand that specialization. Can you run learning and development end to end? Do you know where performance management details into learning and development and then the various outcomes and how to be able to measure return on investment within the learning and development environment? Build that specialist context, but as you grow in your career, it's important to become a generalist so you can see everything. In fact, back in the day in PNG, we used to say you must become a specialist in two areas of HR specialization. Then you go outside of HR, you go and work in the department for a year minimum, and then you come back into HR to then take on an HR business partner assignment. That way, if you are a business partner to a division or to a department, you have worked in that department, you know where the shoes pinch their feet, then you can come back and apply information, apply your first-hand experience into all the HR processes that you are coming up with within that space. So let's look at all of these one after the other quickly. You understand the internal and external business context. What are we talking about? You've all had it a lot of times. So I'm not going to bother you too much. Conduct your SWOT analysis. What does SWOT mean? Your strengths, the weaknesses, the opportunities, and the threats. What are the strengths of your organization? What are the weaknesses? What opportunities exist for you as a business? And what are the threats that your business, you know, is subject to? Or even for your department as human resources. And then conduct a personal analysis of your company. I mean, I, I mean, even while I was with CIG, I mean, I still got some calls today and then, you know, people were asking me questions. You know, we have started projecting to say, what will be the implication of election in 2023? How will it impact our business? With the change of the currency, how would it impact cash flow? There is a digitization drive of the CBN, which is gonna come off the back of that. It's gonna come off the back 
of this change of currency and be prepared for it? How would it impart some of the artisan work or the people we deal with? You know, in many organizations, there are many people that you pay by hand. The plumbers, the bricklayers, the carpenters, the generator repairers, all of those people. But the bank is going to come up, the CBN is going to come up with restriction on the amount of cash you can carry. And everybody must carry out their operations, leveraging their bank account. So you might not even be able to pay them cash anymore. It will then require that what? You pay into the account. They themselves, when they go into the market and they want to buy some of those products, they will have to pay via a digital means. And cash will be reduced to the barest minimum. How will it impact your business? And why should I know my business? If you don't know how your company makes money, how then do you help them to find the people who will lead that drive to making money? How will you be able to structure your performance management process to ensure that we are making money? How many of you know that your front office to back office ratio should be between 30, 70, 60, 40? You should never have more people in the back office than the front office guys who are making the money. So if you work in a hospital and your finance department is 20, but you only have 15 doctors, I'm sorry, you guys are joking. The doctors are your front office. They are the money-making part of the organization. There is no way your back office staff finance will be more than your front office guys. The ratio should be 70% or 60% for that front office, the money-making guys, and then between 30 and 40% for the back office guys. But if you don't know this, you won't pay attention. And even when the data is staring you in the face, you will know what is going wrong. And you'll be wondering, we are not meeting our budget. Then we need to right size. And then what you are still looking at is, oh, these salespeople are not making money. Maybe we even reduce them further. And you would not know where to start the business cut or changes. Now, you also need to evaluate what are the major cost drivers for the business? What do I mean? What are the major expenses that your business incur? And how do we save on some of these expenses? How do we identify possible leakages? And some of the savings that we are making from these things can even go into funding your HR initiatives. Many of us come back and say, eh, well, the company does not always provide us training budget. They don't provide us budget for this budget for that. My dear brothers and sisters, you can fund it from this. I remember back then at FBN Capital, um, before it became FBN Quest Merchant Bank, um, HMO, we changed the process. Rather than registering married people under family plan, we decided to register married people under single plan, whereby the man is single, the wife is single, and only people with three children or more are put on the family plan. Because if you add up all the single costs, it's a whole lot of savings for us. We saved 50 million that year. I didn't return the money back to the company. I simply pumped it into our learning and development, excuse me, learning and development initiatives. Those are sources of funding for your HR initiatives. So stop beating your management and be asking for more money. Look for the major cost drivers and find out you can save money in all of those things. And once you do, you can use them to fund other aspects of human resources that need support within your organization. So understand the internal and external business context for your organization. Next is for you to create strategy alignment. You see, at the table of management, what they discuss is profits, volumes, market share, return on investment for shareholders, et cetera, et cetera. And once they are discussing all of these things, they are not interested in anything, anything that is not aligned to these things. So what do you then do? All your people's strategies must be in alignment to profit, volume, market share, and then return on investment for shareholders. If you can marry every initiative you have to all of these points, trust me, 
the organization will support you. And that's why I said creating strategic alignment by speaking the language of the business and all your people's strategy must be in line with the business direction. The business cannot be saying we want to expand into several other areas and you are coming up with focusing on employee value proposition first. You want to come up with what? How do we place people in all of those places and then also groom local talent there to be able to support the business in initiative then what are the processes towards supporting them you must pick what is priority first and then back it up with the rest of your hr initiative and guess what the are is going to trust you for your words because like they say in god we trust all others must present data chicken that's all create your strategic alignment number three initiate and lead change initiate and lead change to be able to discuss this, I have put my very favorite video. You know, our ice bag is melting here. I'm sharing my sound already. And if your internet drags, I'm gonna wait some minutes for you. So please just bear with me. I'm gonna play this video. We're gonna watch it together. And then I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And then I'll ask you guys as many as possible to come on video. And I would ask you a question on why they should listen to Fred. And in this situation, you, human resources, you are Fred. How did Fred lead the change management process in his colony? We are also going to adapt that to leading change management process in our respective organizations. So happy listening and watching. This is a story about. I believe you all can hear the sound. Please confirm to me. Somebody can unmute himself and say yes. Yes, we can. Yes, we can, sir. Beautiful. So I'm going to continue. About a flock of penguins who live on an iceberg in Antarctica, the South Pole. They are like a big family. They have been living as a colony on this iceberg for years. As far back as they can remember, it is their home. They don't know it yet. But change is coming for them. In order to survive, they will need to learn the change management process one step at a time. When they aren't hunting for creatures in the sea, they spend most of their time with friends and relatives. Except this one, Fred. Fred is unusually curious and observant. He watches the sea and stuffs his observations, ideas, and conclusions in a briefcase. One day, Fred learned something alarming. Oh boy, I have to do something. I gotta tell Alice. This is Alice. She is one of the Penguin's Leadership Council members. She is tough and has a reputation of getting things done. Alice, can I speak with you for a moment? I believe that our iceberg is melting. Really? Well, show me what you mean. So Fred took Alice to the heart of the iceberg. See, Alice? Our iceberg has cracks that lead to larger caves. If the ice melts sufficiently, water will pour into these cracks in caves. If we have a cold winter, the water in these cracks can freeze quickly, trapping water inside the caves. Then, as the temperature goes lower, the water in the caves will freeze too. This freezing liquid will expand in volume causing our iceberg to break into pieces. This could destroy our home and place us all in great danger. Hmm, this is not good. We must bring this information to the leadership council. I'll prepare a presentation to convince them that something must be done. The leadership council consists of Lewis, the head of the council, Alice, Buddy, the handsome, charismatic one, and Nono. A cranky penguin who is responsible for weather forecasts. Causing our iceberg to break into pieces. This is wild speculation and fear-mongering. Our iceberg can withstand such fluctuations. Can he guarantee his data and conclusions are 100% correct? I can't. But if our iceberg breaks into pieces in winter, wouldn't many of us die? Imagine parents who lost their children coming to us and asking, why didn't you foresee this crisis? It was your job to protect the colony. What would you tell them? If Fred is correct, we only have two months until winter to react to this threat. 
We must inform everyone. This calls for a general assembly of the colony. No! It would be very bad to worry them! We don't want to panic anyone. We must keep this a secret! I have an idea. Would you give me a few minutes, please? Fred went quickly down the mountain and arrived minutes later with a glass bottle. Let's fill this bottle with water, seal it, and leave it in the ice overnight. Then tomorrow we can see if it's broken by the force of expanding water as it freezes. If I am correct, the bottle will be broken. Let's do it. We'll meet here tomorrow morning. The next morning, they found the bottle broken. Oh. I'm convinced. We have to do something about this. Let us call a general assembly of the colony. And with that, the penguins started the change management process with step one. Create the sense of urgency. Clearly, our iceberg is in danger. But I am confident we will find a solution. We need to act quickly. The next step was step two. Pull together the guiding team. A diverse team of five penguins was given the task of finding a solution. Lewis, Alice, Fred, Buddy, and Professor, who was the smartest penguin in the colony. Each had different strengths, and together... They were the best team for the job. Their task was step three of the change management process. Develop change vision and strategy. I've got an idea. Let's move to the center of Antarctica, where ice is thicker and stronger. We will be too far from the water. How will we get fish? What about using super glue to hold the iceberg together? <laughs> That's very funny. Look, up there. The seagull. It can't fly forever. It must have a home somewhere. It could be very lost, but it doesn't seem to be afraid. What if moving from one place to another is just the way it lives? Like a nomad. I can almost see how we might live. We'd learn to move around. We wouldn't try to fix melting icebergs. We would just face up to the fact that what sustains us can't go on forever. Our founder had this same idea when he moved our colony to this iceberg years ago. This sounds like our best shot. Let's inform the others. Their next step was number four. Communicate for understanding and buy-in. Lewis called a general assembly again to tell all of the new strategy. Since Buddy was the best storyteller, he was chosen to tell the story of the seagull. Then Lewis addressed the crowd. We are not chained to this piece of ice. Let it melt and break. We will find other places to live that are safer. Although many penguins were relieved to hear this, many were still skeptical. So Alice came up with the idea of putting slogans on ice posters to win over the support of the colony. They worked hard to educate and gain their support. Then they moved the plan forward with step five, empower others to act. A scout team should go and look for another iceberg. Assemble a team and get ready. Yes, sir. Of course, it didn't go smoothly at first. Arguments broke out among the scouts, but Lewis dealt with them in a straight and direct way, keeping the focus on the main task. Then Nono started forecasting storms to discourage the scouts and lower morale. Lewis told Nono that his forecasting services are not needed at this time. Many of the penguins, particularly the young ones, were scared about the upcoming move. Buddy asked the teachers of the colony to speak about bravery to these young penguins. He inspired them to come up with Tribute to Our Heroes Day for when the scouts return. Next, they needed to act and make some progress. This is step six, produce short-term wins. The strong, bright, and highly enthusiastic scouts jumped into the water and searched for a new iceberg that would be good enough for them to move to. My life was boring. Scouting is fun! I will do this for the colony! My family will be so proud of me! When the brave scouts finally returned, they were tired and hungry, but they were greeted with a hero's welcome. They were given medals and food. They told amazing tales about the sea, about swimming long distances, and about new icebergs they had seen. As happy as everyone was to have this successful trip completed, it was no time to rest. They pressed onward 
with step number seven, don't let up. The next day, a second group of scouts went out and found the best iceberg for their new home. This iceberg has everything we need. A tall snow wall and good fishing sites. During the migration, our young and old can rest along the way on small icebergs. Let's waste no time. Start the migration before winter hits. The colony moved to the new home. The move was chaotic at times, but with Lewis's leadership and Buddy's encouragement, they arrived safely on the new iceberg. However, they still needed to take one last step. Number eight, create a new culture. Although the new iceberg was solid and safe, they decided to move again the year after to an even better iceberg. They learned that to survive, constant change must become part of their culture. We can all learn something from the fable of these penguins. Is your organization safe? Are you sure that your iceberg is not melting? Here is a review of the change management process that the penguins used. Step one, create a sense of urgency. Step two, pull together the guiding team. Step three, develop the change vision and strategy. Step four, communicate for understanding and buy-in. Step five, empower others to act. Step six, produce short-term wins. Step seven, don't let up. And step eight, create a new culture. Think about these steps and how they work for our clever penguins. They can help you embrace change and keep you ahead of your melting iceberg. The end. I hope you didn't grab popcorn then. <laughs> nope, nope. All right, so this is my question. <laughs> this is my question. Why should they listen to Fred? Why should they listen to Fred? Anybody, anybody, let me just make this interactive. Why should they listen to Fred? Anybody, I've stopped sharing my screen. You can unmute yourself and speak. Everybody is shy. <laughs> Make I no go talk something. No, remember they are recording this. <laughs> Fred was very observant. He was always recording data. Remember I told you that as part of the transformational HR, you need to pay attention to data. He had data to back up every claim that he had. And when he had his observation, did Fred just go to everybody in management to talk to them? Hell no. Somebody's hand is up. Who is that? I think there is a hand up. Andrew, you can unmute and speak. OK. So uh, I think Ogabik has already started sharing a few of the things I wanted to mention. Of course, you need to create the need, um, create the um, urgency or create the need for change. You need to tell people why there has to be a change that, okay, um, with the data you have, this is what, you know, like data analysis, you get the data, then you uh, project it and say, from this data, this is what you think will happen. So you share the picture to them. To the people that matter, agents of change, those that will buy or key into that change philosophy and help you, you know, run with it, not just everybody. If you tell everybody that the ice is melting, everybody, a lot of people will call your bluff. But there are people you will talk to, that they will listen to you and they will help you, you know, push it up there. It might just be one person in management that you will sell the idea to that, okay, fine, let's restructure this or let's transform this or let's change this. And the person buys the idea and presents it up there. You might not have a voice there, but that person has a bigger voice than you, so to speak. Someone in management and buys the idea, and it runs, runs with it. Yeah, Thank you very it. much. Yeah. Thank you very, very much, Andrew. If you also listened to that video, he said she, he went to talk to Alice and then the video described Alice. He said, Alice is a powerful member of the leadership council and has a reputation for getting things 
done. Remember when they were then introducing the rest of the leadership council, they also introduced one of them, no, no, who is the cranky, pessimistic one. And it was the one who was quick to what? Say, no, this is all rumor mongering. Can he guarantee that his predictions are 100% correct? And Fred said, no, but I have a presentation for you. Remember when he was leaving that cage with Alice, he said, I will make a presentation for them tomorrow. So HR, do you have your presentation? And when we say presentation, I've seen a management, HR management report, and it was 72 pages. I'm like, eh? Which MD we sit down and read 72 pages? It's not possible. Maximum, two, three pages, maximum. They just want to see the summary, major highlights. What is working? What is not working? What requirement? What support you need? end of discussion and updates on any specific program, I mean project that they have assigned to you. End of discussion. Don't tell them 35 people proceeded on maternity leave. Keep, uh, who that want help? Management just wants overall summary of everything that they are saying. That is why they had to listen to Fred in that particular situation. He was very wise. He was very, very factual. He was also, of course, you know, uh, he had his data. He led the change. And at a point in time, do you realize that the name of Fred was no longer mentioned? He had institutionalized the entire change management process. And that's why everybody listened to Fred. So if you want to initiate and lead change, you've got to also act like Fred and follow the change management process. That video is available on YouTube. You can watch it over and over again and then take it forward from there. Next, before we wrap up, build employee commitment and capacity. What does this mean? Be a champion of career management. Gone are those days when people are happy coming in and then being on the same job for 17, 18 years. No. They want to ask, where am I going to be in the next five years? And what should I be doing now? I always tell people, career is like a triangle. When I was in Airtel and we had that all employee forum, almost 500, over 500 employees signed in because the Zoom link could not take more than 500. But I, then I had 720 employees. So if anybody drops out at any point in time, another person immediately logs in. And then they ask the question, promotion. So I, I then turned the question around on them. So. Here I am, what is my next level within this company? And then people busted into laughter during that town hall session. I said, because we all need to understand one thing. Promotion is no longer a function of tenure in the company. It is a function of number one, availability of the job role. And then number two, your own performance. Because why promote your child from primary one to primary two when he's still going to be doing primary one work? So why will I promote somebody from level A to level B and he's still doing level A work? There must be job enrichment. So be a champion of career management within your organization. Number two, identify and respect your employees' needs and also leverage Maslow's hierarchy of needs. What does this mean? Don't just assume everything, you know, oh, the employees will generally love things like this. Employees will generally love things like that. It's not always so. And all of these employees belong to different economic groups. So for the directors, they are not just going to be moved by your 5,000 era voucher for employee engagement when they answer a trivia question. What's their business with that? They are moved and motivated by something different, a sense of fulfillment and accomplishment of goals. You must look at your employee population and stratify them too. So identify their needs, respect those needs, provide feedback, never leave them guessing. Never leave them assuming. Work with all of those things to be able to ensure that you are providing the right need for your organization. Next, clear communication. You can never over communicate. However, you can under communicate. Keep the communication channels open. Communicate, communicate, communicate. Next is encourage team bonding. It can be virtual, it can be physical, depending on your area of work. 
encourage that because you begin to pick what subtle cues from all of those team bonding sessions and then it helps you to be able to go back into your total employee value proposition and then you can come up with something else for your organization and then create clear strategies for employee engagement keep changing this with time and season and your employee demographics and your employee demographics and like i said keep all of these things at the back of your mind moving on quickly because of our time execute with excellence what does this mean you know for many of us at you know the director level um i mean i dare say oftentimes when they ask us you know what's going to be your first responsibility or what are the hr goals within the organization we say it, strategy structures policies and procedures but i always say one thing at the end of it all all of these will go down the drain if there is no execution. Your ideas will forever remain ideas unless you execute. If there was no execution, we will never have iPhone 1. You can keep improving on the process, but you must execute. So to execute, what should you do? Number one, set a clear HR vision. Number two, quality regular meetings with key stakeholders not just everybody key stakeholders and those stakeholders does not mean management only there are people who are great influencers within the organization and outside the organization you may say eh, i work in a what's it called i i, I work in, in 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 a finance company what's my business with you know understanding what cbn is saying my dear sister you need to understand what CBN is saying. Do you know that CBN has a list of all financial experts that have been blacklisted in Nigeria? Do you know that CBN keeps their file such that you cannot hire them to work within the financial services sector or take up any finance related roles again? You must meet your key stakeholder, whether internal or external. Number three, measure what matters. I have seen it on the group. So many people are asking, please, can somebody share with me some of the HR metrics that you should be reporting? You will get 101 different templates. Don't just share all kinds of metrics that is not relevant to your organization. When you share some of them, sit down with your business head and go through them with those business heads. They will identify the metrics that make sense to them, the metrics that matter to them. Once they identify those ones, then you continue to refine those. And then you ask them, what information do you do? Or do you need? Or what decisions do you take off the back of these metrics so that it helps your thinking about how to refine that data better? Don't just give them everything garbage in garbage out eh? whatever you define i will give it to you you will see and there it's not done like that then get hr champions in the business outside of hr don't let it be all hr people are fair you must have hr champions just like we say when we are building culture have culture champions in each of the teams you must have your hr champions people who will champion the initiatives of hr and then be accountable with your partners whether it is stakeholders whether it is you know um union whether it is management whoever it may be ensure that you share your accountability so you fulfill your own part while they also fulfill their own part next champion and protect ethics and due process number one you are the eye of the business at every point in time leave a board board please don't get involved in so many funny things i can say to you look there's a whole lot that stinks in leadership. I, I, I need to be very frank, you know? And that's why I say it now to many people off the back of, you know, hindsight. Watch your back and never be a victim. Document everything. Document everything. They're giving you go ahead to do A, go ahead to do B. If you have a contrary opinion, drop an email with your advice. Don't challenge them. But just saying that we recommend A, B, C because of X, Y, Z. And you just share that one and you know, you just let it be so that it is documented. Because the day when auditors will pick it, whoa, they will deny you to your face. So don't be the victim. Be transparent in all you do. Keep your private life off public view. Many of us in the name of, oh, I'm being transparent, you know, we share everything. For crying out loud, they don't need to know everything. 
So please champion due process. SOPs, SLAs, follow them to the letter. If you are going to do anything outside of those things, document the review process or the exception process in working outside of those laid down rules and build a justification for it and let the necessary approving authority give their approval before you go ahead. And then it now brings us back to where I started from in my opening introduction, where I talked about technical competencies. Please guys, beyond the lingua and technical jargons that we HR professionals throw around, please know your job. Understand there is recruitment in HR or talent acquisition as some organizations call it. Understand there's learning and development in HR. Understand there's performance management in HR. There's payroll management. There's total compensation and benefits management. There's HR business partnering. Understand there's employee relations. Understand there's industrial and labor relations within human resources. Understand there's organization design within HR. Where is your own 40 and background? Don't just say I am a generalist at junior level. Let me tell you something. Most of you who say we are generalists at junior level, we are simply administrators. We want to do recruitment. We are the ones who we call the candidate. We are the ones who we send them email. We are the ones, look, let me tell you, an SS3 holder can do that job. All they just need to do is show him the templates by which he can do it. You are a recruiter. Have you gone through a competency-based interviewing training to be able to understand how to be able to find quality talent or the person is simply mesmerizing you with his English language? And people still do what we call voodoo hiring, where they just rely on gut feeling, where they just rely on, you know, halo effect in the whole interviewing process. You must understand those things. The best way to predict future performance is previous performance. And people will always demonstrate those behaviors in their previous performances is the same behaviors they will mirror in future performance. And so what behavior did they demonstrate in the past? Recruitment. Then how do we fish? We must have the job description clearly articulated. We must have the KPI also clearly set out the reporting line the grade level is there a salary band for this job role then you go to the market then when you are on linkedin how do you search for the candidate type in the job title you may even streamline it by industry and then you will see people with similar job titles and then you look at their current job description and that's why some of you you need to upgrade your linkedin profile you look at similar job description between your, I mean, similar profile with your job description. And then once you can see like a 70 to 80% match, then you want to have a conversation with the person. And there's a specific email. Hello, XYZ, dear XYZ. I am recruiting for a role, for a role of a ABC and I found your profile to be interesting. Would you be interested in discussing this opportunity further with me. I am reachable on OHO 090. I am reachable on rvictor98 at whatever, whatever.com. Detail it all out. And then they come back to you. And remember, you're not doing any candidate a favor by interviewing them. It's a mutual relationship. Don't get into the interview hall and be sitting like what? The principal from our old day school. No. But at the same time, candidates should also not be cocky because we have seen a lot of that also play out in the name of being woke in this generation. Learning and development. At the end of performance management, in the performance feedback, most line managers will talk about some of the limitations of their people. Oh, I think you will do better if you understand Excel. That is your reference point to drawing out your learning and development calendar. Because if you go and meet any of them and say, what are the training needs of your people? The first thing that will come to their mind is send them to your business school. 
Oh, send them to this place. Send them to that place. Everybody just wants something they will put on their CV, and that also makes them feel good. Not specifically related to the job description. And people are looking for external training that will take them outside of the office. And people see training from the point of view of it is just another employee motivation tool. Sorry, training is not employee motivation. Training is equipping employees for optimum productivity in their current and future roles. Learning and development specialist, please know that. So you are not just the coordinator who looks for facilitator and then you just arrange all the events and everything. There's a lot of tactics involved in union negotiation. I mean, the, the CBAs are always there, collective bargaining agreement. How do they arrive at it? What are the previous CBAs? What are some of the previous areas that have been naughty? How do we align with management before we even go and talk to the unions? How do we ensure that we have our partner ready, best alternative to a negotiated agreement so that I am not just going to give them my partner immediately. I come up with something first before I then come back to my partner and then we wrap it up there. The ethos of all of those union negotiation. All those things are crucial and critical for you as a human resources professional. So how many people are there that have been motivated to move beyond the administration and they are making a pledge to say all the opportunities available for us on HR mentoring group we will be able to use it to hone our skills. I, I think there's a mentoring uh, opportunity too for you to be able to speak to someone, to be able to guide you through. And then you can read, I see a whole lot of materials. Do you know what I do? I download those things and I archive them on my laptop as my reference point for anything. I don't read every book, page one to 100 at the same time, no. I just do type in my search word and any book that has that thing, I go to that section, read that section, add it to my knowledge, use it on whatever I'm working on, and then I continue getting my job done. This is the basic fundamental for human resources moving beyond administration. So finally, what are some of the tips for an effective human resources management? Number one, stay focused on the needs of the business. Top leadership, sponsorship, and buying is mandatory for you to succeed as an HR professional. Comply with the company strategy. Work in line with business goals. Correspondence with stakeholders. Remember, I said it, continue to engage them. Employees and top management's involvement in company's development. Have HR champions across all sphere of the organization. Change management and communication strategy, speaking the language that everybody understands. Communication is not just about sender, receiver, noise interference, and all of that, blah, blah, blah. GNS 101 in back in the, our undergraduate days. Communication is presenting information in the best understood format by your target audience. You can never over communicate, but you can under communicate. And like I mentioned, address issues and issues relating to resistance to change. Don't just wish them away. When you do all of these things, you are not just an HR coordinator anymore. You have now become a proper HR professional who has moved beyond administration. As I wrap it all up, my friend B.B. King will say, the beautiful thing about learning is that no one can take it away from you. My first degree was in zoology, and as a student of evolution, I learned the second law of evolution from Charles Darwin in the book, The Theory of Evolution and Natural Selection. The second law of evolution is called the law of use and disuse, and it states that what? The part of the body that we do not use atrophies with time, means it dies away with time. So if B.B. King says the beautiful thing about learning is that no one can take it away from you, what about if you don't use it? Then you will lose it. So I have modified it to say the beautiful thing about learning is that no one can take it away from you, but you. Why? Because if you don't use it, you will lose it. So continue to practice and therein lies your own confidence. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for having me. If there are questions, please feel free to bring them all right now. Thank you very much. Thank you so, so much. Are a bit of
This is indeed explosive. Excellent as always. I'm happy we have decided to bring you on board as the last facilitator for the year. So that as people are you know, having their Christmas chicken, they are also strategically advancing forward. 2023 is not going to be business as usual. No, at the difference all. between exceptional HR and mediocre HR is going to be even clear. The difference in wages and salary is going to be wider. Sure. Which side of the divide are you going to be on? Sure. Leverage on information, leverage on knowledge. Be a specialist. Leslie George shared something either today or yesterday and was talking about the fact that what you do can any other ordinary or average person do it? How difficult is it? Do you have mastery? Do you have competence? Victor Adebayo has brought it home again. If you have any question related directly to what we have discussed today, please don't bring random questions, please. <laughs> questions related directly to what we have discussed today. Please raise up your hand. I would like to take a few questions. We will not take people who raise their hand after others have asked their questions. Okay? <laughs> we know they are, they are not being led by the spirit. <laughs> Please raise your hand if you have any question or the alternative, you can also drop your questions in the chat box and um, Victor will pick them up from there. Okay, I suspect people are still processing the information that was a that was a banger you shook all the tables and shook all the chairs in fact you shook the building let me put it that way <laughs> we, we we just needed to be brutally honest we, we can't go into 2023 doing exactly the same thing i mean five years six years seven years and all i'm just doing is you know i'm still a coordinator of events come on we, we, we've got to be more technical than that. Shei Adebola, your hand is up. Shei, you can unmute. Unmute yourself, Shei. Aha. Uh -huh. talk. Yes, sir. Shei, you okay. need to unmute again. Yes. Go okay. ahead. Yes, thank you, Victor. So, um, I'm glued to my seats. Um, I'm here to recover. Uh, but the question is, in the organization you find yourself, mm. having led roles, and you've read out so many components of HR, mm. and your management still expect that you oversee and expect report from you. And when you're even telling them these things are too, um, they are not strategic enough, ABC can handle it. And they will tell you, no, I don't trust ABC. Whatever you don't give us, we don't want. And expect you to be on almost everything at every time. Hmm. How do you manage that? Knowing well, your- but your management is just afraid that we know you believe in your own team, but you need to prove us more. So how do you address that? Thank you. Thank you very much. I mean, you, you, you are one leg in, and one leg in means you've earned credibility. They trust you, they know you are thorough. So every other time you are meeting with them, Take along your lieutenant, whom you have assigned that responsibility to. Let the lieutenant make the presentation, and then you can make some comments, you know, on top of that presentation when he or she is done. And then when they ask questions to this person, allow and enable the person to respond to all of those questions. And in situations where you don't have anything to add, you just tell them, I have absolutely nothing to add. By the time you do this two, three, four times, they will meet this guy on the corridor and also engage him. And then he will be able to what? Also articulate those points. And by the time they come back to meet you and they confirm it, gradually 
they will begin to trust this person. Gradually, they will begin to count, you know, that this person can deliver. And it's one thing I do. I, I think one of the things is that many people are afraid that if my subordinates know so much like me, uh, they will easily kick me out. And because those ones are earning lower salary, they'll just give them small salary increase and then they will keep them. So, no, start putting them, bring, take them into some of those meetings. I, I, I'm very happy about some of those that I did in my, you know, Tarai days. Um, the current head of HR there is also, you know, someone I used to take into management meetings. He was just my HRIS guy. Uh, today is the head of HR there and he speaks and they listen. I, I'm no longer there, you know. So start from there. Be taking them into those meetings, let them champion it, and then I'm sure it will move from there. Thank you very much, Jay. Absolutely. Jennifer, you have the floor. You can unmute. All right. Good evening, sirs. Thank you for a wonderful time, as always. So I'll go straight to my question, and it's this. As much as we're expecting um, HR professionals and leaders to be strategic in their duties and delivery to companies and organizations, the truth is that some um, organizational leaders, they have not grown to um, put HRO in that, um, at that edge where they understand that HRO should do more than administration. There are still a lot of companies, there's still a lot of organizations that feel like HR, you're just here to do the administrative part. And so mind that business. How would you as a HR professional break that chain and try to develop yourself within that company to be able to grow beyond administration? Thank you very much. Um, I think it starts from you providing insights from what you have observed within the organization. You know, very many people, we have chunks of data in front of us, but we never see bother about, you know, analyzing this data. So when you start observing data, making inferences from them, you are still doing your job. But then when they are saying certain things within the organization, oh, you know what? So as we used to do, let's do this thing, da, 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 da. And you say, we can do it that way. But what I have noticed is this, and then you open your laptop or your system, and then you show them trends that shows that that thing always comes back to haunt the organization. Even if you are not able to convince them at that point in time to change their mind, you have already sown the seed of conviction in their hearts. And when it boomerangs again, they won't be able to call you. They're like, ah, and you said it too, and you said it too, and you said it too. Okay, next time. So we listen to you. So now that you have said it, what is the recommendation for us going forward? T, you can't put your own future at the mercy of the organization of a, of a company that you are working in temporarily. Your own growth is in your hands. Don't allow them to be your excuse. It's very easy for us to worship barriers, but we must be strategic about it. I have moved on from HR to several other functions, and it is all a function of me volunteering to do work that nobody sent me. I can remember when we had, you know, aerial gold issue, where aerial gold leaked, you know, a week before we launched it, it leaked, and then our competitors launched their own product. The same wrapper, the same thing, a 10 million US dollar project just went down the drain. They flew in somebody from South Africa who worked for the company. He retired from the South African version of the FBI, and he wanted to teach us about what? Information security. And they were looking for an information security spokesperson. I just put up my hand. I'm in HR. And the guy taught me. He said, Victor, I'm going to teach you many bad things. Stefan of blessed memory, he died in a car crash. He said, I'll teach you many bad things. There's nothing like anti-terrorism. There is terrorism training. We will teach you to become a terrorist, but you will only use that knowledge to catch terrorists. It's like what we call ethical hacking today. We have been taught how to hack accounts. 
but your intention is different from those who do it for malicious purposes. So you want to say, where is the vulnerability here? How easy is it for me to be able to hack this account? Once you are able to hack in, then you look for how to block it so that somebody who is trying to hack it from outside will not be able to succeed. That is where the hackical hacking comes from. But I learned all of those things and then eventually became useful for me because at the time, IT was reporting into me. So don't let them be the reason why you will not continue. You continue to pay attention to data. You continue to attend training on recruitment. So what are some of the things you can also do? Some of your friends are also recruiting. Join them in the recruitment like you know, you are a recruitment specialist to be able to hone your skills. You shortlist the CV. And sometimes when they want to do senior level interviews, you ask them, can I be a member of the panelists? I am not going to ask any question. I just want to observe. And you see the way they ask them questions. Can you tell me about a time you solved a difficult problem before? What was the problem? How did you solve it? And if you were not able to solve it, where are your learnings, you know, with the power of hindsight today? Those are not common questions. You see when they are interviewing interns or junior level, you know, employees. But what do you do? You have picked that from there. And then you add it to your knowledge. And of course, forum like this also helps. So everything you've learned, start putting it into play. Start demonstrating it. Whether or not they appreciate it, you demonstrate it. But what you are unconsciously doing is you are sowing the seed of conviction in their heart. It may take a while before it germinates, and different hearts are different, you know, soil types. It will germinate over a period of time. You may or may not be there in that organization anymore, but that skill and competency that you are built in yourself may be your selling point to the next organization that would appreciate it. Because you can't come to my organization and say, hey, my former organization, they did not allow me to be strategic. That's why I'm administrative. I'll say, sorry, I need somebody strategic. Hey, take me now, give me a benefit of chance. Take a chance on me. No, nah, man. I want somebody who can prove to me that he knows what he's doing. So get those things ready. Be demonstrating them. They appreciate it. They don't appreciate it. You know you are honing your own skills. Take a pair of eyes, look at your data again. I, I mean, what is our attrition rate? How long do people in this particular department last? In my FBA Capital days, there's a department that every two years is a completely new face. It led me to speaking with my COO, and then we investigated the matter, and we found out that the head of that department, who was a director, he was just a bully. So people could not stand working with him. We tried to come up with some interventions at that point in time, but the organization chickened out because he was bringing in a lot of money for them. Until today, they have the attrition issues. They didn't list him, but guess what? I mean, it helped me in other areas of my work. In other companies, I've moved on to. And I've been able to what? Use the same thing to correct several anomaly in different places. So, you just need to practice it and then get it done. Uh, I can see a lot of questions here. Somebody says, and when the HR head is the bully, what do you do? Are you reporting to God though? <laughs> Send him to HR mentoring group. We will coach him. Maybe he's feeling insecure that his job is on the line. If my team members know this thing so much, they can take over my job. It may be his uh, orientation and how he grew up. We, we will help him. So send him to us. But if it's getting too much for you too, my dear, you know what? Um, you can also start looking out. It's not compulsory. Life is short. You don't, want to, you don't want to spend the rest of your life with someone who will not appreciate what you bring to the table. So it's important that you, know, you also take note of that. Uh, I'm trying to check some of the other questions. Um, how can an HR generalist gain a specialist skill when the organization is not encouraging such? I think I've just answered that question now. So uh, I'm not going to repeat that. Um, then the next one. Sorry. Yeah. Um, I'm Sorry, my, okay, so I've got my mouse now. 
Um, how do you upskill to focus as a learning and development specialist? Uh, I think I made mention of a little within that space. So the first thing is, as a learning and development specialist, you may be there coordinating all of the training needs. So the first thing is you want to engage the person in charge of performance appraisal within your organization. And when you engage them, the way the form has been designed, line managers comments. In between the comments, you will see some of the opportunity areas they have identified for their team members. That's one. There are some performance appraisal documents that clearly captures training needs. You then begin to put all of those things down. So you put it department employee grade level, and then you start populating all of those things. Now, when you look at it, you will see some recurring teams that cuts across several people within the organization. So it may be Excel skill. And if you notice that, oh, about 60, 70% of the organization, there was comment on their Excel knowledge. So you know that Excel skills training is a mandatory requirement for your organization in the next financial year. And in fact, it should happen in the first quarter so that you guys can take the benefit of what? The improvement of the Excel capabilities of your people. So there's the basic, there's the intermediate, and there's the advanced. Then you are able to stratify the people. The next one, oh, he needs to improve on his leadership skills. Then you also pick those things. Now, having identified all of those training, plotting them on the basis of frequency of occurrence in the departments and the level, then you can also validate some of these claims with the HODs. Then having done that, you then sit down and come back to how do we then run it? The organization may not have all the money to come and hire Mr. Olu Yemi to come and do the training for them. But there may be people internally who are great using Excel and they probably can teach it. So you can then begin to say, let me identify internal faculty members within the organization. That is where your ingenuity begins to come in. And then you start a campaign program with some nice, you know, design, you know, are you there? You know how to teach certain skills. You are good with PowerPoint. You can volunteer for the organization. There's going to be special gift recognition for some of such people. And then you can leverage them to render some of the training. You can then also go out there and look for people to bring in the training. I work with training on three pillars, technical skills or functional skills, soft skills and leadership skills, then business exposure, which is seminars and conferences. I, I never get it wrong with those three pillars. So I classify all employee trainings within that area and I ensure that they get those opportunity and visibility. And then we also begin to encourage certification for each of the functions. So each person working in a professional function, even if you work in admin, I encourage you, you must get certified in administration because in admin, there are several aspects to it. There's the facilities management, there's fleet management, you know, several other areas under admin. I need to know all these things too. So read up the various divisions under each of the departments and they will inspire you to be able to come up with something. So it's not just about training plan templates. It's also about the thought process to how do I filter out the core needs and not just meeting the felt need or emotional needs of the people. So that way you can come up and be a bit more holistic in your learning and development for the organization. Um... So thank you so much, Victor. Those two more things I'd like us to do. One of that, those two who will stop recording and do it. I want only people online to have that benefit. And my last question for you, I know you were not expecting this. What does the organization Diversity Talent Management Limited do? Um, showcase one or two things to these um, 100 people. They may be your next client. I wow, wow. Know, <laughs> Thank you very you. much for that uh, <laughs> wonderful privilege. So, um, a little to the history, when I was stepping down from um, Chanrai Group owing to the acquisition of the company, um, the owners of the business then engaged me as a consultant to also manage some aspect of the HR work. And so the first thing we started with was, you know, manpower outsourcing, whereby a lot of the outsourced staff were being managed by Ross. Today, we have over 2,500, you know, outsourced employees that we manage for about 10 different organizations in various you know, industries. And then we also then request, I also requested for the training budget of the organization so that we could run and lead training 
for the organization. And then the third thing was recruitment. But today, diversity talent management has grown. You know, we've expanded in our operations. So it starts from strategy sessions. So December now, everybody is planning for next year. I know we've run strategy sessions for a number of organizations, Sterling Asset Management Trust Limited. Um, what's the name of this pharmaceutical firm? About six different firms like that across different industries. We run their strategy sessions every year before the new year. Then we also do, of course, recruitment and head hunting. Then we do learning and development intervention. We do manpower outsourcing, and then we do business process outsourcing. So there are about three clients that do not have an HR department. So if you walk into that organization today, you ask of HR, they will introduce you to the HR manager, but he is not a staff of that company. He's actually our own staff. And then they are providing all the necessary HR support. So they can also draw from the strength of the back office team to be able to solve all the HR issues within that organization. And of course, they have me to also run things by. So if you want to hire me, uh, I'm not that expensive. It's just about six million monthly net. Uh, and my pension should never be less than one million monthly. <laughs> but you can hire me indirectly by partnering with those guys because they will run some stuff by me, you know, to say, hey, boss, you know, this client is asking for this thing. This is what we think. What do you think? And then I can share with them, you know, these are what my thoughts and this is how to go about it. So it's an indirect backdoor way to get in expert advisory services for all of your HR work. So that's what we do at Diversity Talent Management. Thank you. All right. So if you don't mind, you can either share phone numbers, they can reach Diversity through on the chat box, email, any information you want to drop on the chat box. I'll just round up now, then we'll come back for a few minutes after we sign up, let me just quickly thank you once again, uh, Victor Adebayo. I, I, I do not take this for granted. Thank you. We were supposed to have this session yesterday. Some things came up. And yes. Scheduled, but you agreed to the schedule at the earliest. Some people yeah. said, why Monday? You can see if you have value. Even if you take the program to the moon, people will get to the moon to, to extra value. At some point, we are about 110 on this group and many, many more people will watch on, on YouTube. Thank you um, so much. Um, I, sometimes I wonder how it is that I just get privileged to know people. You know, I'm so happy to know you personally. I cannot guarantee that I will not invite you again. What I cannot <laughs> also guarantee is whether you'll be available or whether you say yes or no. But whatever it is, and on behalf of everyone who have joined us tonight, through traffic, some people got home early, some people stayed back at work just to listen in. We say thank you to you, and we say thank you too to everybody who has joined this session. Please, one thank you or payback you can do to Victor. Victor doesn't necessarily need your money appreciation. He needs execution. He needs implementation. Victor would like to meet you at the airport maybe in January or in February, and you say, oh, Victor, because of that session we had together, I introduced this in my organization. Because of that session, I introduced this in my personal professional space. Because of that session, I became a specialist in one or two domain areas. That is the best way to appreciate Victor. Thank you so much. We'll meet again. Thank you, 